Okay, so welcome everybody to this little talk on prayer and peace pandemic edition. Um, the structure of it's going to be pretty, pretty simple. We'll start with prayer and then we'll talk about peace. <laughs> so when it comes to prayer, I want to talk about first off what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. And then we'll talk about some saints and what they had to say about prayer, namely St. Augustine, St. Dominic, got to get St. Dominic in there. Um, St. Catherine of Siena, another Dominican, she's amazing, and St. Teresa of Avila. And then when it comes to peace, I want to go to that great Carmelite, St. John of the Cross, and then St. Francis de Sales, who wrote an amazing work called Introduction to the Devout Life, which is also just filled with a lot of great advice um, and pull a little bit out of there when it comes to peace. And then finally, St. John the 23rd. He wrote a whole encyclical, Pacem in Terris, right? Peace on Earth, and get some concluding, concluding remarks from St. John the 23rd. So first, prayer in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, I was a little bit shocked, honestly, to see how strong the Catechism is on prayer. It's, <laughs> get ready, buckle up. So the Catechism in paragraphs two, 2742 to 2745, it says, against our dullness and laziness, the battle of prayer is that of humble, trusting, and persevering love, right? Love is what makes prayer without ceasing possible. This love opens our hearts to three enlightening and life-giving facts of faith about prayer, the Catechism says. First, right, it says, it is always possible to pray. And second, prayer is a vital necessity. Third, prayer and Christian life are inseparable. So first, it's always possible to pray. This is because prayer is not some, it doesn't always have to be some walk myself in a room, pray to my father in secret thing. We're constantly thinking. We constantly have thoughts running through our minds. Well, that is prayer if you invite Jesus, if you invite God into that conversation, right? That's why it's always possible to prayer. St. John Chrysostom, right? He says, it is possible to offer fervent prayer even while walking in public or strolling alone or seated in your shop or buying or selling or even while cooking because prayer is, it's, it's, it's not only just an inner dialogue with the one you love, Jesus, God, the Trinity, but it's it's kind of this direction of the heart. <clears throat> so even if you're focused on something else, it can still be a prayer if your heart is directed to loving service, loving works of charity for God. Okay. And now the second one, this is this is where it where it gets a little a little intense and dramatic here. The catechism says prayer is a vital necessity. Um, nothing is equal to prayer. St. John Chrysostom says, for what is impossible, it makes possible. What is difficult, easy. For it is impossible, utterly impossible for the one who prays eagerly and invokes God ceaselessly ever to sin. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that's such a bold claim. And it's quote straight from the catechism, right? And then St. Alphonsus Liguri, right down here, this little thing, this is like, <laughs> those who pray are certainly saved. Those who do not pray are certainly damned. <laughs> like, wow, it doesn't get more stark than that. Prayer is a vital necessity. We have to be praying. But the, the thing you have to remember when you hear a quote as bold as this one here from St. Alphonsus is that it's a prayer in a sense is kind of like breathing, but it's also just kind of like digesting food. If you want to get an analogy to how our body works, growing in prayer is, is kind of like this, this, this system where you, you, I mean, you can live your life without ever praying, right? So you can't really say prayer is like breathing. Um, but prayer can become as effortless as breathing if you really grow and mature in the practice of it, right? So it's tough finding a really clear analogy for what prayer is like when it comes to the physical because prayer reaches the whole spectrum, right? For our eternal life, if we're not praying, it's like not breathing because you're certainly damned, right? <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> but that's what he says. Um, 
Okay, let's go on to the third point that the Catechism says. Prayer and Christian life are inseparable. Because prayer and Christian life, Christian life are the works we do for love out of charity because we love God, right? So Christian life is, is what we're doing, and prayer is the conversation we're having with God. They're inseparable because prayer and Christian life deal with the same renunciation. When you're acting out of charity, you're forgetting yourself, you're acting out of love for the other. And in prayer, you have to forget your own will and you have to think about the conversation and what you love because it's a conversation with God. Prayer and Christian life also deal with the same filial and loving conformity with the Father's plan of love, with the same transforming union in the Holy Spirit, and the same love for all, the love with which Jesus has loved us, right? So Jesus doesn't say just love your enemies. You also have to pray for your enemies, right? They go hand in hand. Um, our love and our prayer has to go hand in hand. Um, Origen, he's one of the early church fathers. And when he was trying to explain this prayer, pray without ceasing, he says, he prays without ceasing who unites prayer to works and good works to prayer. Only in this way can we consider as realizable the principle of praying without ceasing. <clears throat> so the Christian life and prayer, they need to be together. Okay, so that's, that's what the catechism has to say about prayer. Now let's move on to St. Augustine. St. Augustine, one of the most prolific church fathers, one of the most amazing saints. I'm sure you guys have heard of him before. Um, what I'm going to draw from is kind of obscure, though. He wrote a letter to Proba. <laughs> and in this letter to this lady, he's talking about prayer. And it's, it's all about prayer. And he has a few really good points about it. He says, well, basically, Proba asked him, why do we need to pray if God already knows what we need before we ask, right? There's that gospel passage that says the sparrows and everybody, God provides for them. Don't worry about it. God will provide for you. Well, why do I need to pray if God already knows everything I need? That's her question to St. Augustine. And this is how St. Augustine responds. He said, God wants us to exercise our desire through our prayers so that we may be able to receive what God is preparing to give us. Because God's gift is very great indeed, but our capacity is too small and limited to receive it. So we're like tiny little cups. And St. Augustine says the point of prayer is to grow into a big goal. <laughs> or something else so that we can receive more of God's gift that he wants to give us. The deeper our faith, the stronger our hope, the greater our desire, the larger will be our capacity to receive the gift, which is very great indeed. So when St. Augustine deals with this pray without ceasing, this is what he says it means. He says, desire unceasingly that life of happiness, which is nothing if not eternal. So that's how St. Augustine says, pray without ceasing by desiring unceasingly the life of eternal happiness. Never stop wanting eternal life, basically. That's what his, his prayer without ceasing, that's how he interprets it. Um, okay, now St. Dominic. St. Dominic, founder of the Dominicans. Yay, we're dressed the same, you can see. I don't have my big black cape on right now, but this is what I wear. <laughs> Same thing for a really long time. It's beautiful painting here. Um, and St. Dominic had these, he didn't write much. He was kind of like Jesus. He didn't write too much, but he left a whole bunch of wisdom to his followers and the people he preached to. And some of the early Dominicans wrote down these nine ways of prayer that they would see St. Dominic praying. Like this is how he would pray in these nine different ways. And it, it's kind of taken off in our order and we follow these different ways of prayer at different moments and different times. But I just wanna share those nine ways with you quickly. Ah, I'm in the way on this one. Okay, so the nine ways. The first way <clears throat> is just with a humble bow. Now, I should have had the, the general thing at the beginning of this, but you have to remember all of these nine ways they always focused on Jesus Christ on the cross, crucified um, as our Lord and Savior. 
So that's one important thing. Second important point, all of these ways of prayer incorporate the body because we're body and soul. We don't just pray with our soul. We're not disembodied. We're not like souls trapped in the prison of this body or like Plato would say, right? That's not the Catholic faith. God created us with body and soul. They're both good. We will be resurrected on the last day. We'll get our bodies back. So prayer incorporates both our bodies and our souls. So all of these ways of prayer, nine ways with St. Dominic, they all incorporate the body in some way. So first way is with just a humble bow, humility incorporated into your prayer. The second way is with prostrate weeping. Like when you're just weeping tears for the sins of the world and for others, for people you love, um, when you're begging God for, for something, um, you just lay out flat on the ground and beg God with tears. That's, that's pretty common. Third is the penitential discipline. <laughs> this <clears throat> penance and discipline, the way this is understood is basically you're doing penance for people who don't care about God or don't care about anything or the people in purgatory who have nobody to pray for them. Basically, you're taking on sacrifices, you're taking on penance to help get people to heaven, right? We understand life on earth as we want to save as many souls as possible. And we know there are people out there who are blinded and who don't want anything to do with getting into heaven or thinking about eternal life or thinking about Jesus. That's part of why we become religious, which we're like, well, we're going to sacrifice and do everything we can and pray and do penance for all the people who don't care so that we can hopefully get them into heaven with us too. <laughs> so it's trying to get everybody there. And that's kind of what this with penitential discipline is all about. Um, the fourth way over here is with repeated genuflection. So he'd get on his knees, he'd genuflect. And this, when you read the description of it, this is very active. So you genuflect, get up, genuflect, get up. Um, yeah, okay. The fifth way is with open hands. So like this, or like this, or like this. Um, people would say it looked like he was reading a book sometimes. <laughs> like he was holding a book open in his outstretched hands um, during prayer. The sixth way is with outstretched arms, right? Like cruciform on a cross. This is kind of an imitation of Jesus on the cross. You just mirror image of him. Uh, seventh way is with heavenward hands. Now, this is different. It's not up like, like this. It's like this. <laughs> they say, they describe it as if being shot as an arrow towards heaven. <laughs> so that's like pointing up. Um, the eighth way is with holy books. So reading scripture, reading sacred scripture, reading the saints. Um, and the description of this is really interesting because St. Dominic was a very loud prayer. <laughs> like the, the monks in his cell who were next to him, they would hear him praying all night, like being loud and crying or weeping. He'd get up and talk about what he was reading and he'd talk out loud, um, having conversations with God and his prayer with his guardian angel. So he was a very vocal prayer as well. Um, okay. And then the ninth, ninth way is with walking companions. <laughs> so when he'd be walking with a group of people, they'd be talking. And then sometimes he would lag behind a little bit and pray behind people. And then sometimes he would speed up a little bit and be praying in front of the group of people. But, um, yeah, his ninth way of prayer was praying while walking with companions. So again, always focused on Christ crucified on the cross. And we pray with both our bodies and our souls. That's the important point with St. Dominic ways of prayer here. Okay. Now, St. Catherine of Siena. Ah, oh, St. Catherine is amazing. If you haven't read her dialogue, read her dialogue. It was the most mind-blowing thing I read during my Dominican novitiate. I'd never read her before. But she's just so passionate. She's such a, a fireball of love for God and Jesus. It's incredible. <laughs> this this picture over here looks pretty grotesque. She's holding a bleeding, bloody heart. Like, what's going on? <laughs> well, there's uh, her biographer, 
St. Raymond of Capua wrote a biography of her. And one of the stories that she told was that there was this point where Jesus appeared to her because she kept begging, take my sinful heart away. Give me a fleshly heart, right? Take my stony heart away. And this was her prayer for a while. And then she had this vision where Jesus did appear, and like reached in, took her heart out. <laughs> and then for like four days, she was telling her spiritual director, uh, I don't have a heart. Jesus took my heart. <laughs> Your spiritual director is like, what are you talking about? You can't live without a heart. You, of course you have a heart. But she would keep saying this. And then it was a few days later that she had a second vision where Jesus came and took his heart out and put it in her. And so that's what this, this painting is referencing here. Now, <laughs> that sounds like a crazy story, right? One of my favorite questions to ask people is, tell me about the moment in your life when you felt the closest to God. There was a priest in Detroit I knew when I was in there in seminary for my first two years of seminary. And I asked him this question and he told me this story where he was wrestling with God trying to figure out, should I go to seminary? Should I not go to seminary? What should I do? And he said he was driving in his truck one day, and then all of a sudden, Jesus appeared in the passenger seat of his truck, reached over, grabbed his heart out of his friend's chest, pulled it out, threw it out the truck's window, breached in his own chest, and then put his heart in, my, in this priest's heart, <laughs> chest. And then he slammed on the brakes, and... Jesus was gone and he's like, that was the weirdest little vision. Am I going crazy? What the heck just happened, right? Now I told that story so pathetic compared to how that priest told me the story, right? Because when you hear secondhand witness stories, they're just not as good. But then he's like, okay, I gotta go to seminary after that. So then he went to his bishop and his bishop wanted to send him to study in Rome in the seminary. And this guy, and he's like, I'm going to send you to Rome, but you got to go get all your physicals, everything you got to get taken care of. So then he went to get his physical at the doctor and the doctor's running him through the physical. And then the doctor said, wait, if you had a heart attack or something, there's all this scar tissue around your heart for some reason. And we don't know why it's there. It's so wild. <laughs> so, I mean, I hear these old stories of saints like this. They're like, what? I'm sure holding a bloody heart, like Jesus took your heart for a few days. Like it sounds crazy. But at the same time, when you ask people to share their experiences of when they felt close to God, you get amazing stories like that, that they're afraid to tell people because it sounds so crazy. That's one of the most difficult things about sharing our faith is we don't want to come across crazy, but yet God does crazy things. <laughs> And then we complain that he doesn't do miracles these days, but yet he does, but we don't want to talk about it because then it makes it sound crazy. I don't know. It's, it's one of these situations. Anyway, Catherine of Siena, absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I want to share a couple of things from her dialogue where she talks about prayer and peace. She says, for often during the time scheduled for prayer, the devil comes with all sorts of struggles and annoyances, even more than when you are not at prayer. He does this to make you weary of holy prayer. But prayer is a weapon with which you can defend yourself against every enemy. So it's important to remember that it's a spiritual battle as well. You know, it isn't just um, like kind of like meditating to reach this point of peace. There's this peace that you're searching that's that's different than what you normally think when you hear world peace, you know? Um, Jesus, right? He said, I came to bring a sword, not peace. I don't give as the world gives. He's, there's this, this battle of peace. So it's this war, but peace is our weapon. Um, and prayer is our weapon. It's this really kind of weird way to think about it. Um, St. Catherine continues on, right? I beg you, let my eyes never rest. But in your grace, make them two rivers for the water that flows from you, the sea of peace. <laughs> There's so much in that sentence. Throughout the dialogue, she refers to God as the sea of peace frequently. Um, and you can think back to the second way of prayer of St. Dominic, right? Where he's prostrate on the ground with tears, begging God for grace. Um, and, and here, St. Catherine is begging God 
to let her eyes never rest with tears. Let them be two rivers of water flowing from the sea of peace. So that's, that's wild, right? To have tears be a river of peace. Right? It's, 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 anyway, okay, let me go on. There's two more quotes here I want to share from St. Catherine of Siena. Whatever you do in word or deed for the good of your neighbor is a real prayer, right? So it's not just locked in your room. Apart from your prayers of obligation, however, everything you do can be a prayer, whether in itself or in the form of charity to your neighbors, because of the way you use the situation at hand, right? So you got to remember that prayer isn't inactivity. Um, God is pure act. When we imitate God, when we are one with him, we're like a whirlwind of activity, but yet at peace. There's this heart of peace at the center of it. I love what St. Catherine says. This is St. Catherine talking about St. Thomas Aquinas. She says, St. Thomas Aquinas learned more through prayer than through human study. That's, that's, that's awesome. Okay. Now, St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa of Avila is one of the world's foremost mystics, just um, Carmelite mystic, legendary. This is a beautiful sculpture um, of her heart being pierced with love by God. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit. This is, a, this is kind of an obscure work, too. She has more popular works like her life and uh, the, the castle and all these things. But I want to talk about a work she wrote called The Foundations. And this is chapter five. And it has to do, she's writing to people involved in active life who have jobs and who are doing things and helping them, giving them advice for prayer. She, and this, the reason I'm bringing this up is because she's trying to dispel mistakes people have about prayer. So it's very tempting to think certain ways about prayer and she's trying to fix those common mistakes in this. And the first thing she says is, you have to remember that the soul is not the mind, nor is the will directed by thinking, right? For this would be very unfortunate. Hence, the soul's progress does not lie in thinking much, but in loving much, okay? And remember prayer, it, 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 at the heart of it, it comes down to love. At the very beginning, I was, I was, um, talking a little bit about how you can pray without ceasing by um, in, inviting God and Jesus into the internal dialogue you have all the time, right? In one sense, yes, but you have to remember that that's still thinking. In a, in a deeper sense, it's what St. Augustine said, where you have to ceaselessly desire this eternal life. Um, now, the two other things I want to bring up here. Saint, um, Teresa of Avila says, well, sometimes we feel like we're not praying if we aren't alone with God, right? I feel like I haven't prayed all day because I've been running around, chasing all the kids, dealing with all this other stuff, doing the dishes, trying to cook dinner. Like, I haven't had time to pray. I haven't had time to sit down and pray. And she says, no, that's, that's okay. You're, you're deluding yourself. Okay. There, there's two mistakes in that. The first mistake comes from a subtle self-love. And the second mistake comes from a fearful, being fearful of sin. Now, the subtle self-love, <clears throat> what she's talking about there is <sighs> when we do find the time to do like a spiritual retreat and go away to a monastery and sit in a room and actually pray in this deep sense um, where we kind of remove ourselves from life. There is a lot of consolation that comes with that. Usually God will open the gates of consolation. You'll have these spiritual insights and, and it'll feel great. <laughs> well, St. Teresa of Avila is saying, well, if you think you can only pray when you get away or lock yourself in a room or don't have anybody around you, part of that is because of this self-love that's addicted to that feeling of prayer that you get when you're alone and shut everything out. And she says, that's, you got to be careful about that. They find all the happiness that could be wanted in this life where in desiring nothing, they possess all. Nothing on earth do they fear or desire. Neither do trials disturb them, nor do consolations move them. 
In some, nothing can take away their peace because these souls depend only on God. So you have to depend only on God for that peace. And don't be sad when obedience draws you to involvement in exterior matters. Know that if it is in the kitchen, the Lord walks among the pots and pans, helping you both interiorly and exteriorly. Beautiful. Okay, but there's the other mistake <clears throat> that comes from fear of sinning, right? Because if you have time to get away and lock yourself in a room and do nothing but holy reading and prayer and go to mass, then the chances of sitting are so low, right? So you think, oh, I'll be praying because I'll be holy. She's like, no, you're just afraid of sinning. And that fear, you feel comfortable in that fear. But if you're out there doing active things, doing works of charity, taking care of people and doing these things, sure, you may be, there may be more danger in the things that are going on and you may sin more, you may make more mistakes, but it's not a reason to say you can't pray. So the two quotes from this section, here, my daughters, is where love will be seen, not hidden in corners, but in the midst of the occasions of falling. And believe me that even though there may be more faults and even some slight losses, our gain will be incomparably greater. The true lover loves everywhere and is always thinking of the beloved. It would be a thing hard to bear if we were able to pray only when off in some corner. Okay, so that's also really important to remember. Okay, now let's make the transition to peace. I've been talking a lot about prayer. Now let's talk about its connection to peace. And the first one I want to bring up here is St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross is another amazing Carmelite mystic. And he wrote some beautiful poetry and these beautiful works of mystical theology. And he gives us a great perspective on um, a great balance in a sense. A lot of what I brought up earlier with St. Augustine, right? You need to pray to increase your desire, to increase the cup to a big gulp so you can get all that God wants to give you, right? That's, that's kind of what one part that you need to keep in mind. But there's another part you need to keep in mind too where you want to desire God, right? That's, that's the primary thing. Okay. So these, these quotes come from St. John's sayings of light and love. They're short little aphorisms. They're great little, little sayings that you can just sit down and read and think about one and pray about one. They're not very long. It's not coming from a huge, huge book, right? So you can look these up and read through them. They're absolutely great. But I wanted to bring up just four of them here. The first one, Souls will be unable to reach perfection who do not strive to be content with having nothing in such fashion that their natural and spiritual desire is satisfied with emptiness. For this is necessary in order to reach the highest tranquility and peace of spirit. Hence, the love of God and the pure and simple soul is almost continually in act. Now, oh, it, it's... The spiritual life is so like mind bending sometimes, right? Because so much in this paragraph seems to contradict the things we said earlier, right? Like St. Augustine says, increase your desire. Don't stop desiring. Like it needs to get super big. And now here he's like, <laughs> spiritual desire is satisfied with emptiness. Completely like, what are you talking about? We were supposed to get the big gold cup and now we're supposed to be empty. Pick one or the other. What's going on? Um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, we're Catholic, right? We're both and you need to keep both ends of the spectrum in hand at the same time, like Christ on the cross. And you have to, uh, the simple soul is almost continually an act, not hiding in a corner, but it's this tranquility and peace of being focused on God. Blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God pure of heart. This, this point, this focus, this this needle point of love directed towards God, directing you. Um, again, he says, abide in peace, banish cares, take no account of all that happens, and you will serve God according to his good pleasure and rest in him. Okay, I have two more from St. John of the Cross. 
If you desire to discover peace and consolation for your soul and to serve God truly, attend to one thing alone that brings all these with it. Now, see, <laughs> attend to one thing alone that brings all these with it, namely holy solitude together with prayer and spiritual and divine reading and persevere there in forgetfulness of all things. Strive to preserve your heart in peace. Let no event of this world disturb it. Reflect that all must come to an end. Now, you guys are probably getting a really good sense of how this is kind of the compliment to St. Teresa of Avila or the compliment to St. Augustine. There are two mystical traditions that run through the heart of the church, positive mystical theology and negative mystical theology. And both are key. And in a sense, they're kind of the tensions of this prayer and the peace that we're talking about. Prayer is this desire that's focused on God and the peace comes from that focus. But yet, like he said right here, the simple soul is almost continually an act. So you, you have this peace in the midst of the crazy activity, even when you're in the kitchen, the Lord walks among the pots and pans, helping you interiorly and exteriorly. So continually an act, but forgetfulness of all things. What's going on here? It's, it is tricky. It is tricky. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about St. Francis de Sales. He wrote this beautiful book called Introduction to the Devout Life. And he wrote it for everybody. Okay, not just for priests, not just for religious. It's he wrote it so that everybody can, I mean, he was centuries ahead of his time, right? We're all called to holiness. That is the life of the Christian, the, the universal call to holiness of the Second Vatican Council. Well, a couple hundred years earlier, St. Francis de Sales wrote his introduction to the devout life. And he has a really neat analogy. He says, let's think about the angels. Let's think about the guardian angels and their solicitude for us says the angels care for our salvation and seek it diligently, but they are wholly free from anxiety and solicitude. For whereas care and diligence naturally appertain to their love, anxiety would be wholly inconsistent with their happiness. For although care and diligence can go hand in hand with calmness and peace, those angelic properties could not unite with solicitude or anxiety, much less with over eagerness. So here, this, I think, helps give us a little bit of that distinction, that difference that we've seen between St. John of the Cross and St. Augustine, right? There's this love in your heart that's focused, this desire that needs to be united with calmness and peace and diligence and care, right? There's, there's a focus, there's a clarity. But at the same time, you have to be empty from all the anxiety, empty from all the solicitude, empty from all that, um, all the things that cloud that peace. Um, the things that cloud you from imitating God who is in perfect act, the things that paralyze you, you know, because sometimes our, our emotions, our desires paralyze us. It's those, those are the ones you need to be careful of. Okay. Um, two more quotes here from St. Francis de Sales. Now, self-love is a restless, anxious, over-eager love. And so the work done on its behalf is troubled, vexatious, and unsatisfactory. Whereas the love of God is calm, peaceful, and tranquil. And so the work done for its sake, even in worldly things, is gentle, trustful, quiet. Oh, that's so different from our world these days. <laughs> it's so different. But that's what we're called to. We're called to be signs of peace in this world. And then I love this last little quote. Oh, my child, while you slept, God watched over you with his boundless love and breathed thoughts of peace into your heart. <laughs> like, pray without ceasing. Even when we sleep and lose consciousness, our heart is still beating. Our blood is still flowing. That's one of my favorite prayers to pray right before I fall asleep. I'm like, okay, Jesus, 
I'm going to be gone for a bit, but my heart's still beating. Let every beat be a prayer, right? <laughs> and the, the idea of God watching over us and breathing thoughts of peace into my heart while I sleep, that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I love it. Okay. In conclusion, St. John the 23rd. He wrote this encyclical, Pachum in Terrace, right? Peace on Earth. And I have a couple of quotes from it I want to share with you. And the reason I wanted to end with John the 23rd is because everything up till now has been about prayer and about interior peace for us and how we grow in the spiritual life and how we can attain some of that interior peace. But we're called to bring that peace to the world, right? We are called to be the light shining in the darkness. We're called to be that peace that people see and want to be a part of, that joy, that, that centeredness, that, that peace, that sea of peace, like, like St. Catherine of Siena says, right? Um, and so his encyclical is talking about how we can go about bringing that peace to the world. And he says, the world will never be the dwelling place of peace till peace has found a home in the heart of each and every man, till every man preserves in himself the order of, ordained by God to be preserved. That is why St. Augustine asks the question, does your mind desire the strength to gain the mastery over your passions? Let it submit to a greater power and it will conquer all beneath it. And peace will be in you true, sure, most ordered peace. What is that order? God as ruler of the mind, the mind as ruler of the body. Nothing could be more orderly. So this big encyclical St. John the 23rd wrote about peace in the world. He says it has, it won't happen until peace first finds a home in the heart of everyone. Our Lord Jesus Christ, right, going back to the Gospels, after his resurrection, stood in the midst of his disciples and said, Peace be upon you. Alleluia. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. It is Christ, therefore, who brought us peace. Christ, who bequeathed it to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, do I give unto you. Yes, and then I think the great quote to end because it's amazing. St. John the 23rd, everybody has heard this. I've done my best in your service this day, O oh Lord. I'm going to bed. It's your church. Take care of it. <laughs> like, just go to bed with peace. God will hold us all in his hand at the end. Um, and yeah, so that's my presentation. I have one last beautiful surprise. Three weeks from today, I finally got two people. They agreed to come give our next talk. From Hard Science PhD to Religious Life OP, How the Beauty of Nature Leads to Love of God. So November 19th at 7 p.m., uh, Father Gregory Liu, who has his PhD in chemistry from Berkeley, and Brother Pascal Strader, who has his PhD in astrophysics, they're going to come share their conversion story and how the hard science brought them to a deeper life of faith. Um, and the way it's going to be structured is I asked both of them to share about 15 minutes, their conversion story as it's related to their science. And then they're going to have a conversation between themselves for about 10 minutes, just comparing and contrasting their own stories. And then we'll open it up for Q&A for the last 15 minutes or however long. But uh, should be good three weeks from today. So 